to uh, Romans chapter 11. To remind you that we will have uh, Sunday evening worship at 6 o'clock this evening, so I invite you to that. We're studying the book of Hebrews together. Uh, this morning I want to say thank you uh, to you. Uh, it is not easy, if you have not heard it before, uh, to sit through multiple sermons detailing Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. They are considered some of the most difficult uh, passages in Scripture, uh, and many, many uh, people uh, even resist uh, them because of how starkly uh, they talk about the sovereignty of God in all things. Uh, and you have graciously uh, listened, uh, you have been open-minded, you have been teachable, uh, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart as your pastor uh, for at least listening uh, to it and, and listening patiently. I've gotten tons of questions and I'm happy to answer those, uh, but honestly I am just proud of you uh, and I'm, I'm so pleased at the way that you have received very difficult passage of Scripture. Having said that, you made it. This is the last one. Uh, so we'll read together as we usually do. Uh, and it's sort of a summary of everything we've done. And I think that you'll see that. And uh, we'll pray and then we'll, we'll discuss it. Uh, beginning uh, with chapter 11, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight. Well, that's a warning. Uh, Paul is saying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, be careful. Don't think you're big smarty pants about all this theology and doctrine. Be careful, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. Now, a mystery in Bible, uh, in the scriptures, uh, is not an undisclosed secret. A mystery is a disclosed revelation about the way that God works, which would be otherwise mysterious to us did we not have his disclosure and revel revelation. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, and now he's quoting from Isaiah uh, chapter 59, the Deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take their sins away. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. O oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! And now he quotes from Isaiah chapter 44, Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given him a gift, uh, that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning we're so grateful uh, that you have given us your word. And I pray that even though sometimes that word is difficult uh, to understand, even though sometimes that word is uh, hard uh, to apply to our lives, I pray, nevertheless, that we will be open to all that you have taught us in Scripture. And I pray this morning that you'll apply uh, your word to our hearts through the work of your Spirit. For the sake of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed how many things are threes? Uh, even uh, when they're one thing, they break them up into threes. So if you're a realtor, a realtor is going to tell you everything is, and they're going to give you three words, location, location, location. Everything's in threes. Uh, and that's the same thing we do uh, when you come Sunday morning. I'm always giving it to you in threes, aren't I? And I don't want to disappoint you, so I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I know that you worry about that. Look at how he begins 
he begins with a warning. Uh, and the warning is to be careful of something. And the, what do we need to be careful of? That we would be wise in our own sight. In other words, we kind of look at the way we think through things and we congratulate ourselves. Yes, I have figured out the mind of God. Uh, there's nothing I don't know about the way that Jesus works. I've got it all figured out. I've got my theology all lined up. I've crossed the T's. I've dotted the I's. And that's the very thing uh, that the scripture says you have to be careful about. Uh, because the truth is, we don't know anything at all about who God is until He describes it for us, until He defines it for us, until He discloses it to us. We have no way of sort of figuring out God on our own. And so God comes to us and He tells us who He is, and in telling us who He is, it can feel abrupt. I didn't think God was like that. I thought he was different. And that's what we've done in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Maybe some of you for the first time have had to face the fact that God is not at all what you thought he was like. And in the matter of salvation, he is completely uh, sovereign. And this is what he warns us about. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. In other words, the way uh, that you solve the problem of thinking that you have it all figured out is that you need to become aware of something that God wants to tell you. And our lack of awareness is what leads us to having a false sense of our, the depth of our own understanding. We think we know more than we actually know. And so this is what happens in this passage, and now he's sort of summarizing. And if I could give you three takeaways, you'd probably be able to uh, summarize fairly Romans 9, 10, 11, all three chapters. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we want to be aware of something. And what are the three things that we want to be aware of that will preserve us from being wise in our own eyes? Uh, the first thing that you have to understand, he, and he has punctuated this over and over again, is that there is only one people of God. There are not two. Uh, God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't deal with anybody in any different way. There is only one people of God. So we'll talk about that. The second thing he wants you to be aware of is that even though there's only one people of God, it is God who determines who his people are. Uh, God is not uh, sitting on the throne with you crashing the party. The son doesn't turn to the father and say, did you invite him? No, did you invite him? I didn't, you know, who invited him? This guy. God determines who his people are. There's one people of God, and God determines who his people are, but maybe most importantly, if you are God's if you are one of God's people, then you will recognize God's glory. If you are one of God's people, you will recognize God's glory. First of all, there's only a one a people of God. And this is what uh, he is talking about uh, all the way down through, and I won't read it all again, but he said, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What is the point that he's been making over and over again? The point that he has been making is that Israel in the Bible is not defined by genetics or geography. Israel in the Bible is defined by grace. Those who have been given the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ are the true Israel of God. And remember, this is how he started in Romans chapter 2. No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. You don't uh, get defined as an Israelite in the scripture just because you have the gene pool. And then in Romans chapter 4, he says what? Abraham is the father of us all. Jew, Greek, Gentile, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And then he punctuates the point again in Romans chapter 9, where he says what? Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So he's distinguishing between Israel of the genetic code and the geography and the true Israel of God. Now, you say, why do I need to know that? 
What in the world? I mean, who, what difference does it make? So let me just give you a couple of things here. Remember where we're sitting when we're reading this. You're sitting in Rome in 56 AD. And the church uh, is full of uh, Jews and Gentiles. And the Jewish population has been told that they are God's special chosen people. And they've been told this for centuries and centuries and centuries. And now Paul is telling them that Gentiles are included. And it's actually one people of God. And so when you say something like that, that ticks off both parties. Uh, the people who thought that they were unique and chosen and God wasn't going to do, uh, do anything uh, with them unless it was very special and unique, uh, they're not as happy as you think they would be that other people are sitting there. Uh, and then the people uh, who have been included in the grace of God who are Gentiles and not uh, Jews are saying to themselves, well, I guess, you know, are we even chosen or, you know, do we have any special place in the plan of God? And you say, well, that's, a, you know, okay, thanks for the little history lesson, but how does that apply to my life today? And it's every day on your television. Every day. Uh, because you will hear people say, well, uh, we want to make sure uh, that we uh, treat uh, Israel in a very special way. Because they are God's uh, chosen uh, people. And you'll hear politicians say it. Uh, you'll uh, read books that say uh, in some sort of novel form that there's somehow something unique uh, and what you'll be led to believe is that there are actually two ways to be saved. Abraham was saved one way and Christians are saved another way. Or that uh, Israel is to be treated as if they're quasi-Christians. Yes, they did not accept the Messiah, they've rejected the Messiah, but we're supposed to treat them differently. And that's just not right. Uh, you owe no special allegiance to 1948 Israel in the plan of God. It has nothing to do with it. Because what the scriptures are talking about when it talks about Israel is talking about those whom God has folded into his plan from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And that is done by grace. That is not done by your genetic code, and that is not done by geography. So I get questions all the time. Steve, did you read what happened in Israel today? So what do you think the Lord says about that? And my answer is nothing. <laughs> it has nothing to do with the two things. Uh, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I, I almost pay no attention at all to it. Why? Because of verse 25. Do you see what he says? A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Do you see what definition he's using? He's saying that the completed people of God are not completed until all the Gentiles are included. And that was the promise to Abraham. Look up in the sky, and the stars in the sky represent all that your descendants will be. And you will be the father of many, many nations. And so I strongly encourage you not to politicize the Bible. What is going on in the Middle East today, you, you know you owe no allegiance to Benjamin Netanyahu and whatever he decides to do. They are not God's unique special people doing whatever it is that they decide to do. They are atheists. They have rejected the Messiah. Uh, there is nothing unique about that whatsoever. What makes you an Israelite in the scripture is that you have trusted Christ as your personal savior whether Jew or Greek, male or female, from every tribe, uh, tongue, and nation. There is only one people of God. And Israel is not complete until it includes the Gentiles. Tells you that he's using the definition of Israel that he's been trying to teach you from chapter 2. That Israel is not about your genetics. Israel is not about your geography. Israel is about the grace of Jesus Christ. 
and it comes from every tribe, tongue, and nation. So that's point one. There's only one people of God. There's not two. There's not two plans of God. There are not two people of God. There's just one for all times and all places. Everybody mad at me, yeah? <laughs> yeah, not yet. All right, good. <laughs> Second point. Okay, then how are those people included? The same way that they always have been included. God determines who his people are. What do you think Abraham was doing just prior to God choosing him out of the Ur of the Chaldees? Do you think he was seeking God? He was not seeking God. Joshua tells us that Abraham was serving idols. Abraham was a Babylonian. Do you understand that? He, the, the, Jacob, it took you know, his great-great-grandson to be renamed from Jacob to Israel. There was no such a thing. So what he's talking about is that God determines uh, who his people are, and he does it. He says, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and this way all Israel will be saved. So the point that God is making is that there is actually a fixed number of his people. And they are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And God is in the process of redeeming all of those who are His until the fullness, in other words, until the pre-described amount of people who are in His church are fulfilled. That's what He's doing. Now, the minute you say that, I have to remind you of what we've learned. Because when I say that, everybody says, I guess it's only going to be three of us, right? And you will have misunderstood your Bible deeply if you think that. Because the promise to Abraham was, look up into the sky and look at the stars. You will not be able to count the stars and you will not be able to count your descendants. And then when you get to the book of Revelation, who is around the throne? The Bible says a multitude that no person could number. <coughs> In other words, the Lord is going to save so many more than you think that it's just amazing. And it's the Reformed position, whether you want to know it or not, that we believe that the Lord will save the vast majority of humanity. That's the promise of God. It's not about uh, truncating it. It's not about narrowing it. It's about the Lord is continuing to work. You say, how come it's taking so, Lord, the, uh, so long for the Lord to return? Because he's saving people. And it starts with 12 guys. And this morning, there are 2 billion Christians worshiping on the planet this morning. And he's not done yet. And it keeps growing every single year. You might not think so because you look at your TV and you don't realize this great revival in Christianity all over the world. It's just that we're in deep trouble. But if you really want to feel the blessing of God and, you know, have that old-time gospel hour, remember that? Go to the continent of Africa. It's unbelievable. Uh, Brenda and I were in, in, in Zimbabwe. And, and we're, uh, you know, going down the road in one of these open Jeep things. And all over, because you can see forever, all over were these uh, uh, groups of people all dressed in white, gathering under trees. And it was like everywhere you could see. And so I asked the guy, he said, what's that? And he goes, oh, they're having church. He said, everybody's a Christian around here. Do you know that Zambia is a Christian country? By constitution. It's in the constitution. And Africa is exploding with the gospel. South America exploding with the gospel. Uh, so don't look at your TV and think that, you know, there's no victory in Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. God determines that who his people are. But not only that in verse 30, uh, for just as you uh, were at one time disobedient to God, but you have now received mercy, you say, okay, well, we've received mercy. Look at verse 29. What kind of mercy is that? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. It's irrevocable mercy. God is not going to change his mind about you. He's going to save you. That's the promise. And his calling and his gifts, he never takes them back. 
He never takes them back. So it's not merely that there's only one people of God, that God is no respecter of persons. He hasn't decided uh, to create a people of God out of just one country or just one genetic uh, code. He's described as the God uh, who has come to every tribe, tongue, and nation. And he has come with an irrevocable mercy. A mercy that it never takes it back. A mercy that never changes because he is determined to save his people. That is why we are so blessed to receive mercy. Look what uh, he says here. He says in verse 30, For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too uh, have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may also now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Say, so what in the world? does that mean? Uh, it means uh, this. Uh, 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 maybe the best way you would put it is this. Uh, Brenda worked for IBM for 14 years. You familiar with who IBM is? Yeah. So uh, uh, just prior to uh, our moving to Philadelphia, IBM went through a major restructuring under Lou Gerson, the CEO. And uh, he cut 100,000 jobs. And in cutting 100,000 jobs, IBM didn't go away. Uh, and Brenda was one of those uh, that was uh, retained, uh, and she was retra uh, re uh, uh, trained from being an engineer to being a consultant. Uh, and that company still exists today. But 14 years into it, Brenda left. She said goodbye, we're going to have children, we're not gonna do this anymore. But IBM still exists. That is very biblical. Uh, God has created a corporation called His people. Uh, and the corporation doesn't mean that everybody who comes and goes is going to stay in the corporation. And God uses His people. Uh, and the way He uses them is sometimes uh, He uses the disobedience of a people to show other people the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. And so the calculation here, although it seems weird to us, the calculation is this, uh, that uh, the Lord has set his mercy on a people who were not called his people, the Gentiles. And he is doing that so that the uh, Israelites will see how you have been blessed and come back to Christ. That was the whole point uh, last Sunday. And so uh, we're going to see great revivals of uh, Jewish people accepting uh, their Messiah before Christ returns. That's the point. And so the way the Lord does that is through what he told us last week, through jealousy. But remember, it's all based on one thing. Everybody is disobedient. The only way that you receive mercy is because you are the recipient of something that you didn't earn. Obedience earns you something. But all of us are characterized as disobedient. And the only way that we are going to have a relationship with God is through His mercy, where He overcomes our disobedience with the obedience of Jesus Christ. Because Christ obeyed the law for you, He gives you the gift of His obedience. And even though we don't earn our way into the people of God, we are nevertheless received fully into the people of God by the mercy of the Father, because He has accepted the obedience of the Son, Jesus Christ. And so God not uh, only has one people of God, God has determined who those people will be. And he's determined who they will be through mercy, not through your obedience. You cannot achieve your way into the glory of God. You and I are frankly disobedient. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none of us who just love holiness so much we just can't wait to be holy. That's not us. But thanks be to God, even though we're all characterized as disobedient, we are also all characterized as recipients of His mercy uh, and His grace. And that's the good news of the Gospel. So there's only one people of God. 
not distinguished by genetic code, not distinguished by geography. And that people of God, God has determined entirely through mercy and grace. And if that's true, then if you are the recipient of mercy and grace, then God's people always recognize the glory of God. Look at how uh, he ends. Verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments! How inscrutable his ways! That should be your response to Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11. Not, oh, God is so unfair, this whole election stuff, I don't get it. And how come he's making uh, Israel jealous with the Gentiles and then folding us all back in? What a goofy plan of God that is. Well, you know, write your congressman. <laughs> That's how he did it. And then he tells us that. That's how he does it. And Paul's answer to that, remember what the warning is, lest you be wise in your own sight. Careful of that. Our response should be the response of the Apostle Paul. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. That is the response of people who understand who God is and what he has done for us. And this cannot be understood unless you understand the twin truths of the gospel. And the twin truths, you've heard me say it a hundred times, you're going to probably hear me say it another hundred times. You are more guilty than you ever dared believe. But you are more loved than you ever dared hope. That's the gospel. We recognize the depth of our own disobedience. We recognize the depth of our own sinfulness. We recognize how bad it is. But in recognizing how bad it is, we also recognize what a glorious Savior we have in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful God who would save us in His mercy and His grace. How would it be possible for that kind of God, so holy, so inscrutable in His ways, His mind is above our mind, His ways is above our ways, and nevertheless in His Son Jesus Christ has redeemed us for His own glory. That should for you put amazing back into grace. And that's the problem. We love to talk about grace, but it's not amazing enough. And when you realize the distance, the natural distance between disobedient sinners and a holy and righteous God, when you see how that, that bridge has been reconciled only in the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ, then God's people begin to recognize God's glory. And then you begin to worship in a completely different way. Do you notice uh, how uh, he worships here? He worships by reminding himself of who God is. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Folks, worship without a correct understanding of God. Worship without doctrine is just pure mysticism. It's pure emotion, it's pure sentiment, and it doesn't get past the ceiling. You're only truly worshiping God when you're worshiping the true God. And the true God is the one who has revealed himself in Scripture as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and has incarnated in Jesus Christ, and gone to Calvary, and died for your sins. It's the only God available to you. And because that's true, when we worship, we worship knowing something. And what is it that we know? You say, Steve, what does it mean to be reformed? Well, it's a historical reference to the Reformation. We think people have gotten off track. But if you want to kind of get it down to a nutshell, it is simply this. It is about acknowledging in your heart, mind, and soul the absolute comprehensive sovereignty of God. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things.
God is in complete control of everything. He is the King and Lord of the nations. He is in control of your salvation. He is in control of the breath that you take right now. You will not die one minute before He wants you to. And He will control that too. He controls all things. And because that's true, that doesn't lead us to criticize God, but that leads us to say, to Him be glory forever and ever. So this morning, you have been a great congregation. For weeks, you have tolerated very difficult texts of Scripture. But I pray that as we wrap this section up, that you too will understand what you are required to understand, lest you be wise in your own eyes. There's only one people of God. Just one. And th that people of God is defined not by geography and not by genetics, but entirely by the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. And that one people of God is determined by God himself. We're disobedient. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're more sinful than we ever dared believe, but we're more loved than we ever dared hope. And because that's true, God has determined who his people will be. And if you trust Christ for your salvation this morning, you didn't do that yourself. God did that for you. And because that's true, if you are really one of God's people, you will recognize the glory of God instead of the glory of yourself. You will know that God is comprehensively sovereign. There is not a maverick molecule in the universe. He controls everything. And if that's true, you can say, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Let's pray together.